Um, I remember the days of starting the company, and um, there was a three-year process between when I started the company and when we actually had some revenue coming in that covered expenses. The first year was relatively easy because everything's possible. The third year was relatively easy because you could see that that light at the end of the tunnel was the end of the tunnel and not a train coming at you. I do remember the middle year being a little bit difficult. You weren't sure whether you knew what you were doing. And what happens is all of your friends and family say, you know, I know you know what you're doing. I know you're really right, but are you sure? <laughs> or, you know, you really want to make that bet? And they try to be, you can see them saying they're trying to be supportive while also they're not believers either. <laughs> it's the entrepreneur that's the believer. And what you've got to be careful of is when you come up to a question of what is it going to look like or who's going to buy it or what does it do or how is it made or what color is it or who's going to pay for it and you don't have a good answer to that, just say in my heart of hearts, I know when I get to that decision, I'll come up with the right answer. Because the essence of entrepreneurship is to not be able to answer virtually any of those questions. And one of the reasons it's very hard to innovate in government is that the public demands answers to those questions in advance. And they don't exist. You don't know who's going to buy it until you see what you produce. You don't know what's going to be made out of it until you see what's available. You don't know who's going to pay for it until somebody actually opens their checkbook or takes out their credit card. Mm -hmm. In business, it's not quite as bad as in government, but you still have a board of directors or something to answer to or your family to answer to. And I've always thought that one of the reasons my company was successful is our competitors were two big giants. And they couldn't answer, if there were, were people, maybe there were, I don't know, but if there were people smart enough to say, Bloomberg's coming along, it's going to be a com competition, we've got to go do these things. Within those companies, they could never justify what it was that was coming or how they would answer it. And the companies were making money, which was the best because big companies are slow. Big companies that are profitable really never change, which is why big companies don't go on forever. You go back and look at the history of business, there are very few companies that are 75 years old or older. There are very few companies that are even 50 years old. Uh, you, know, you go right down the list, you'd be shocked at how short the time span between being brilliant and being so stuffy you can't compete in the world passes you buy is. And it is because of that. Uh, how do you keep reinventing yourself internally when you're doing well? It's very, very hard to do. And entrepreneurs don't have the legacy, the friction, the disadvantage of having something to protect. So, you know, you go out there, and if I have to give you advice, it's number one, outwork the other guy. That's, I mean, that's a secret in life, I've always thought. Be the first one in, the last one out. Don't take any vacations. Don't eat. Don't go to the bathroom. Whatever it is. You know, there's always the story that you, luck, you have to be lucky. Uh, but that the harder you work, the luckier you are. That really is true. So for young people, whether it's entrepreneurs or just somebody going to work in, in, in business or in government or anything else, people say, how do I succeed? Number one, outwork the next person. And it's the one thing you can control. You can't control how lucky you are, although it comes out of the work. You can't control how smart you are or whether you have this advantage or you're the right place, right time. But if you work harder, all of those things are more likely to break in your favor. So work hard. Second thing is listen to everybody, but don't take it too seriously. Even when you're building a product, people say always listen to your customers. You should always listen to your customers. That doesn't mean you should do what they say. Your <laughs> customers are good at what they do. They're not good at describing what they do. They're not analysts. You know, they're salesmen, manufacturers, uh, creators or whatever, but they're not the kind of people who can describe adequately what they do. And they do things very differently. I'll never forget one time at uh, Solomon Brothers, we were trying to do something, and conventional wisdom was that everybody behaved in a certain ways. And I asked somebody to go up and stand on the balcony overlooking the trading room with a pad, and every time somebody did whatever the thing was, touch a button or pick up the phone or whatever, make a check mark, and people couldn't have been more wrong in describing what they did compared to what they actually did. So, you know, do your own independent research. 
don't depend on anybody else. Be lucky, but that comes out of hard work. And you've got to find something where there is a real market for it. Not just because you can do it, but if you're on the other side of the desk, why would I buy that from you? Same thing I give young people advice when they're going for an interview. Why should the person on the other side of the desk hire you? You walk in and you say, oh, I know all about your company. I've read the prospectus. I read your annual report. I can save you General Motors. Come on. <laughs> Nobody thinks some kid out of school is going to save General Motors. But if you walked in and said, look, I'm young. I'm hardworking. Um, I got a decent education. Um, I'm willing to listen. And um, I, I can cooperate with people and work together. Okay. That's the person I would hire. The first person, not in a million years would I hire them. Who's, who do they think they're kidding? Same thing is true when you're starting a business. You've just, you know, listen to people, but don't take everything they say as gospel. Anybody has any questions? I'd be happy to answer a couple. We have a couple minutes. Uh, uh, yes? How did you come up with the idea of the Bloomberg box? Well, we didn't have, keep in mind, when I started the company, uh, you're, a young woman like you would not know this, but <laughs> PCs didn't exist. I understand that. And the Internet didn't exist. I understand that. And I remember going up, I had an engineer, he, and he really was the uh, design, the electronics. I would go up on weekends and solder resistors and capacitors into circuit boards. We made our own computers, mm -hmm. and we rented telephone lines and rented space at the other end and had lines going out. We made our own Internet. But... What we did, which was smart, I think, was when PCs came along, we stopped making our own because we can't compete. You know, you know how many PCs Dell makes in a year, or IBM in those days made PCs. That was the original PC; it was an IBM product, um, and we got out of that business. And then the internet. We can't compete with all of the big telephone companies, and we didn't try to. We, if somebody came along with something better, use it. Don't, you've got to be very careful. There is always this not invented here thing. And you've got to be honest and say, I know I put my heart into building this computer, but we're not going to be able to catch up. We're not going to be able to stay ahead. Same thing with the Internet. Um, I had worked when I'd worked for Solomon Brothers. I lost a political battle, got pushed out of the equity area, went to run the data processing side of the business, and had earlier built a system and then built it another one for them and then when I got fired thought you know that's the kind of thing that everybody could use uh, and so uh, we started it and uh, that's, that was the genesis of it sir as the uh, as you survey the economic landscape today what does the entrepreneur in you uh, think better about? chance than ever before <laughs> because number one there's people available there's space available um, capital's probably hard, but you know, entrepreneurs don't need that much capital to start. There's, and there's always venture capital around. Because you're talking about if you go to start a business, none of you are going to need a billion dollars. You need a small amount of money. And there are angel funds and venture capitalists who are willing to do it. So, uh, and, and also, when people get depressed and lazy, that's a good time for you to come in. Uh, it's in boom times, it's harder to do. It would be h easier in boom times to start a company and take it public and bail out and leave somebody else with the ruins, which invariably is what happens to 99% of those companies that go public. But in terms of building a business, I think it's a great time to do it. And also, incidentally, when a lot of entrepreneurs like me um, start companies when they get fired. So, you know, the choices of timing isn't necessarily up to you. You, know, you may have gotten fired like I did in, in good times, or you could get fired in bad times. It's probably easier to explain it to your family in bad times. But I, <laughs> Yes. Yes, Mr. Bloomberg, uh, I would like to thank you so much for um, those 11 initiatives. I read about them in Wall Street Journal last month, and this is truly exciting time for all of us. And on behalf of all of us, we would like to thank you for making this possible. Really? Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yes, Miss. Well, I mean, I think, like in real estate, there's three things that matter: location, location, location. <laughs> I would argue in this, there's hard work, hard work, hard work, and a couple of other things. But it's it's more than anything else. You know, you got to put miles on your skis to get experience. 
Um, luck comes to those who are there at the time. That's putting the time in. Um, people respect others that work hard and do things themselves. Then they'll follow. Um, you can build teams. I would, the second thing, if I have to give advice, I guess, is uh, give credit to others. Because if you want, there's almost no, there's nothing that I've ever been able to come up with, maybe you, you can, uh, where you do it totally on your own. Everything you do things with other people. A reporter, a guy sitting right behind you, writes a story, but it's this editor that edits it, and there's a headline writer that puts it in, and it's somebody else that gives them the, places it in the paper. Uh, there's nothing you do on your own. So if you give credit to others, they'll be much more likely to help you. And also, it is, doesn't hurt you. People still think great things about you if you give the credit to others. Get rid of the words I and me, I've always said, and replace them with we and us. And uh, yes? Um, we were talking earlier about, you know, the need for, you know, infrastructure as we start businesses and things like that. And you mentioned there's space available, et cetera. What about a public private partnership, much so the Angels did in 2000, where the city creates some space that we can meet as we build our businesses and use each other and yeah, resources. In New York City is trying to do that. Other places are trying to do that. Um, you know, technology has made a lot of these things easier to start a business. Uh, the downturn in the economy makes space available. But, you know, the cost of having your own billing system, the cost of having of, of advertising to, in some places, of, of communicating, all these things have come down so dramatically from the time when I started a business. And I would have said then things were a lot cheaper than before. Um, the trends are uh, going in the direction to make diversity easier in terms of lots of new businesses or different approaches to problems or doing it from different places. Uh, so I think uh, you still need a good idea, and uh, you've got to implement that idea, and you've got to implement it in a ways that is useful. The other thing is when you implement something, uh, you've got to come back to who's going to buy it and what, why would they buy it and what are they going to pay for it. And I've always loved these people that price things based on what their costs are. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You price things based on what the client will pay for it, and if that price is lower than what it costs you to produce, you go out of business. If it's higher than that, you make money. But the pricing should be based on the marketplace and not on your internal controls. You set the price based on the marketplace and then go back and say, okay, this is all we can get for it. Let's find a ways to make it for that price less a spread because you've got to be able to make money. Uh, yes, sir. Can you start off what kind of resources did you have any resource initiative like you guys set up here to kind of help you get your business off the ground? Well, I, I was lucky. When I got fired, I was a general partner of the company. So I mean, the press always writes we had severance. I, I wish we did. We didn't have severance in those days. That's a modern-day concept that I've never been thrilled about why you fire somebody and give them some money unless you had a contract in advance, which is fair enough. If that was the deal in getting somebody to, somebody to make them, like taking over a, a tough uh, a business that's near disaster, nobody's going to take that job unless you do agree to, if it doesn't work, give them some money. And I don't have any problems with that. But um, I was lucky enough to have a piece of the company, and so that's where the money came from. Uh, but it was I went every day. I, I used to uh, buy uh, coffee and tea. I'd have tea with milk and without, coffee with milk and without, and a decaf with milk. I didn't bother the six of them. And uh, sugar in the bag. And then I'd go into this company that I was trying to sell to. In that case, it was Merrill Lynch. Uh, early in the morning, 6.30, quarter, 7 in the morning. And I'd walk down the halls looking for somebody in an office with the door open. <coughs> Never was a secretary there to act as a gatekeeper. The decision makers were in their office early, typically reading a newspaper, and I'd walk in and say, hi, I'm Mike Bloomberg, I just bought you a cup of coffee, can I talk to you for a few minutes? Mm. Most people won't say no. Every once in a while, somebody said, on time, or get out of my life, you know. <laughs> people, and, then, and, and then you had a chance to talk to them and build a relationship. And you don't know whether those people are the decision makers and the thing you're trying to get, get them to do, but down the road it certainly doesn't hurt. All the decision makers talk to each other at the water cooler or maybe in, they're equal and have meetings together or whatever the case may be. But finding a ways to get through, and it gets back to that, be the first one in, the gatekeepers aren't there. 
and the people who are there are the entrepreneurs or the hard workers, the dedicated ones, the successful ones like you want to be. So, you know, it's a self-selection process here. At 7 in the morning, those are the people you do want to talk to. She's walking up, so I can tell you that's her signal to tell me this is over. Uh, anyways, uh, good luck to all of you. Um, I do think it's a great time. Uh, some things will succeed. Some things don't. Um, if you take a look at who runs great companies, every one of them had setbacks in their careers. I don't know of none of them that had this meteoric rise. Those that are really successful came from state U or didn't even finish college. In some case, didn't even finish high school. And uh, they uh, all had big downturns. But they just they had that ability when somebody slams the door in your face to just get it. It isn't like you like it. If you like that, you should see a shrink. It is to get it out of your mind and go ring the doorbell the next time or even the same doorbell. Not only with a smile on your face, but really convince yourself that you're going to be successful in making the sale or getting the company going or whatever it is the second time. I really think that's the key. If you have to say to yourself, uh, the book says I have to be um, optimistic the second time, you're, you're going to fail. If you convince yourself, I am going to do it the next time, and the last time was an a the, when the guy said no, I slammed the door in my face, it was an aberration, then you really will be successful. All the best. Good luck to all of you. Thank you.